For most of the time that humans have existed, there has only been one way of surviving, of getting the food that is the basis of everything we do. That way has been to hunt food that moves and gather up food that doesn't move. This was the way the first humans lived, and it continued to be the basis of life for more than a million years. Significantly, it was a way of life that helped to produce modern humans by forcing those early hunter-gatherers to use their imagination and intelligence. The first people to move out of Asia into the Pacific colonised many new islands and environments. They found new foods and had to develop new ways of catching them or in the case of some plants, new ways of treating them before they could be eaten. The discovery of Australia was a whole new story, an entire continent with a completely new range of plants and animals. Somewhere here in the tropical north, the first Australians came ashore more than 50,000 years ago. Their first camps would have looked like this one on Melville Island north of Darwin. These are the sort of shells they collected for their first meals. The sea snails, the pippies, the oysters, even a large helmet shell. And soon after that, they would have found the local ironstone and used it to make tools, including axes like this one. During their long occupation, the Aboriginal Australians began to control, even modify their environment, to an extent that's only now being understood. And yet they never took the step that people did elsewhere to cultivate crops and domesticate animals. The Aborigines preferred, perhaps perfected, the hunting and gathering way of life and developed it with fascinating variations right across the continent. In this episode, we'll see what it's like to be a hunter-gatherer, to live off the land. <laughs> What seems so simple and precarious, in fact, provided a rich and sustaining existence for a whole continent full of people. Those first settlers found a coastal environment just like the one they'd left. The seafoods were the same as those in the islands and on the Asian mainland. So it's likely that as populations grew or new groups arrived, people spread first along the coast. The sea provided them, as it does now, with a constant and unfailing source of food, if you know where to look. The Tiwi people of Bathurst and Melville Islands, north of Darwin, are a very distinctive Aboriginal group. They're probably the darkest of all the Australians. The turtle's nest can yield a surprising number of fresh eggs and carrying the eggs away is not a problem.
Their islands are 30 kilometres from the mainland, cut off when the seas rose at the end of the Ice Age. And the Tiwi have developed their own independent culture. They're famous for their funeral ceremony, involving elaborately carved and painted Pukamani grave posts. Turtles have been overhunted for their meat and shells and today they're protected in Australian waters. But Aboriginal people are still permitted to take them because they hunt in a traditional way for their immediate needs. They pose no threat to turtle populations. For hunter-gatherers, every environment has something of value, even those that seem bare and uninviting like mangrove swamps. Traditionally, a Tiwi man might have a number of wives. The head of a household, as many as 10 or 12. In the past, the men and women went hunting for food separately. Today, men often go collecting with their wives. Shellfish are a staple food all over the world but they don't often grow as big and juicy as these. <laughs> Aboriginal cooking is very simple. Without any cooking containers, nothing was boiled or stewed, just put on the embers or baked in the ashes. These mussels cook quickly, preserving all their food value. I 
In the tropical north of Australia, a patchwork of different habitats provides an abundance of food and raw materials for the people who live here. In most parts of Australia, it's gathering, not hunting, that provides the basic food supply for Aboriginal people. We all have this image of man the hunter, tracking and spearing large animals like kangaroos and emus. And of course these large hunted game are prized and sought after. But it's the search for small animals and plants that can be gathered by hand that is the crucial activity. And most of that is done by women. Looking in different places depending on the season, women gather an amazing variety of foods. Seeds and fruit, nuts, eggs, shellfish, lizards, even honey. These are the things, the daily bread if you like, that feed the people. Here in central Arnhem Land, the monsoon rains are over. The creeks and billabongs are full of water and a good place to look. <laughs> Lily bulbs, roots and stems are basic vegetables. Not only are the women expert gatherers, but they also enjoy hunting. Cooperative gathering by women can produce an enormous amount of food. In the water, besides fish, there are baggy, rough-skinned file snakes. Good white meat. In the trees and holes under rocks live nine different kinds of goannas, monitor lizards. Put together, these reptile catchers make up a lot of protein. Rotting tree trunks don't look promising, but these women know better.
Despite their appearance, mangrove worms are a delicacy. Mud crabs have powerful claws and command respect. A morning's hunting and gathering provides lunch for a large group. No shortage here of protein, carbohydrate or fat. These people are from Manan Greeda a large community on the north coast of Arnhem Land, run by the 1,200 people who live there. For a long time, they were encouraged to eat processed foods from the supermarket, city food. But in the last 10 or 12 years, many family groups have been going back to their traditional lands for at least part of the year. The children are taught how to hunt, and they all gather and enjoy the much healthier bush food. <laughs> like everyone else, Man and Greeda people enjoy fresh crab on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Across Arnhem Land, round the Australian coast and along most rivers and lakes, shellfish gathering has been a basic part of Aboriginal diet for many thousands of years.
While most of the foods eaten by these Australians leave little trace, shellfish are an exception. Everywhere there are piles of empty shells, shell middens. These middens really are a tribute to the bounty of the sea available to hunter-gatherers and of course to the energies of the Aboriginal women who collected them. Some middens are so small they represent just a single dinner camp and others so vast they must represent years and years of feasting at the same spot. And it's anyone's guess how much time and effort went into a midden like this one at Weeper on the Gulf of Carpentaria. There are several of these big middens here at Weeper, all of them surrounded by bushland and several kilometres from the sea. You may wonder why would the Aboriginal people have bothered to bring the shells all this way inland before eating them? Well they didn't, because when these middens were built about 2,000 years ago, the sea was right here, and it's the sea that's retreated since then while the middens have stayed put. So far we've been looking at the northwest coast of Australia, as if the original settlers came into Arnhem Land. Some people may have entered Australia from the northwest, but others certainly came this way, from the north. On this northern coast of Greater Australia, many of the first colonists lived in and moved through the dense tropical lowland rainforest of what is now, of course, New Guinea. As people moved further south, they followed the rainforest along the coast into what is now Australia. And even though New Guinea and Australia are now separate, there's still enough of that rainforest left in Australia to prove the ancient link, hugging the coast here in North Queensland. In this area, some of the new arrivals continue to make their home in the rainforest. The Aborigines who chose to live in the rainforest found an environment very different from the rest of Australia. It was wet all the time, very dark and dingy, and choked with vines and trees. As in other places where there's rainforest, the first adaptation was a physical one. The Australian rainforest dwellers were small, able to move easily through the gloom. The one thing they didn't have to worry about in this part of the driest continent was water. But living in the rainforest did mean new and special adaptations. Unlike the open country, the rainforest floor is dark and covered with leaves. Birds and animals are hard to track and spear, so people have to make special traps and nets. Many of the rainforest plants are poisonous, so people have to learn how to cut them up, pound them, soak them in the running water to get rid of the toxic substances before they could cook and eat them. It's interesting, but when Captain Cook landed on the coast not far from here, his men tried to eat some of the seeds that they'd seen the Aborigines eating. They even gave some to the pigs. But because they didn't know how to treat them properly, the seamen got sick and the pigs died. The largest rainforest animal is the cassowary a flightless bird like the emu. In North Queensland, the people, remembering past traditions, have begun to dance again. Dancers reflect the ways of the cassowary and of the hunters.
rainforest people have almost disappeared and their traditional life has gone forever. We're only now beginning to find out some of the details of how they lived. Organic remains like wooden tools and houses don't last long in this environment but a few archaeological sites have been found and this one near Cairns is almost two and a half thousand years old. These are some of the shells that the people brought up from the coast. And this is one of the special stones for cracking the edible nuts that grow in the area. To make the holes this deep must have taken generations of use. These stones are quite small artefacts, but nearby on the coast, are the remains of the largest artefacts made by Australian hunter-gatherers. One of the implements of these rainforest people that hasn't disappeared is this, what you might call in modern jargon an automatic seafood retrieval system. In other words, a fish trap. It's made of granite boulders brought down from the slopes of Hinchinbrook Island just off the coast here. And it's a once only investment in time and effort because once it's built all you have to do is wait for the tide to fill it twice a day and when the tide goes out you simply come down and pick up the catch. There are lots of different fishes, barramundi, mullet and groper, Lots of different sorts of shellfish, worms and mud crabs. Even the oysters that hold the rocks together are a sort of edible cement. It's another example of just how good hunter-gatherers were at minimising their effort and maximising their leisure. Inland from the rainforest is the more typical Australia. Dry, rocky country with sandstone cliffs and open forests. Compared to the coast, it doesn't look like a good place to live. But of course there were people here too. There are very few signs of them, though, until you look under the ledges and overhangs. It's often thought that hunter-gatherers, like Australian Aborigines, spend most of their time desperately trying to get enough to eat. But you can see that this is nonsense by simply looking at the amount of time these people spend in social and cultural activities like art. Art takes time, lots of time. 
And right across Australia, there are literally thousands of galleries of art. Huge and often very impressive open-air art galleries. Paintings and engravings produced by generations of artists creating new images and often repairing and extending older ones. Most of this art links the people to their land. The creation stories, features in the landscape, the animals and plants around them, the seasons, and sometimes creatures of the supernatural world. Right across the north, there are dramatic illustrations of the spirit people. In the northwest, it's Wanjinas. In Arnhem Land, it's Mimis and lightning beings. In Cape York, it's Quinkins. Establishing the age of cave art is always difficult. The figures are often repainted or covered with new images. In any case, we cannot date the pigments. But this cave at Laura contains designs carved into the rock walls, and some of these extend down into the soil which has built up on the cave floor. Archaeologists have been able to radiocarbon date charcoal in this soil, and engravings below this are at least 13,000 years old. The east coast of Australia, with its abundance of food resources, was an inviting highway south for the early arrivals. Just like the long surf beaches and rocky headlands, the bays and river estuaries along the east coast of Australia are very rich environments. They're sheltered, so they're good places to live. There's lots of fish and shellfish, and not far away there are usually good supplies of other animal and plant foods. So it's not surprising that there are often rock art and engraving sites, as well as the camps and places where people live. There's evidence of Aboriginal occupation just up here. Twenty years ago, I excavated a human skeleton that was eroding from the floor of this rock shelter. The roof is still black from the fires of the people who lived here. You can see bits of mussel and oyster scattered down the slope. This whole bank is the refuse from all the meals that were cooked in here, probably over hundreds of years. With piles of shell like this and overhangs with fire blackened roofs, you don't need to be an archaeologist to recognise the signs of Aboriginal occupation that are just everywhere around here. A lot of Aboriginal tribal groups, large numbers of people, lived around this estuary over many thousands of years. I grew up here and I know how rich it still is. I used to get oysters off the rocks here, caught fish out there, even dive for abalone over there in the bay. People still find this place very attractive for the same reasons that Aboriginal people did.
For most of the time that Aborigines lived around Sydney, the harbour didn't exist. It was a river valley leading out to the coast much further east. But there was an even more significant difference in the coastline further south. By 25,000 years ago, at the height of the Ice Age, the sea level had gone down so far that there was a land bridge linking Tasmania with the rest of Australia. People walked into this new territory and settled one of the most southerly and extreme habitats ever occupied by men and women. The west coast of Tasmania is a wild and desolate place, blasted by the winds of the Roaring Forties. Hardly a soul lives here now, but the almost continuous middens of abalone shells and seal bones show that until about 200 years ago, Lots of people made an easy living here. The southwest of Tasmania is a huge wilderness. The scene a few years ago of battles between conservationists who wanted to preserve it and engineers who wanted to flood the valleys for hydroelectric power. The main battleground was the Franklin River. untouched by Aborigines or Europeans, it has been for thousands of years one of the world's last great natural stretches of wild water and virgin forest. This part of the Franklin River Gorge is one of the most inaccessible places in Australia. It takes days to walk in here from the coast through really rough country and even coming in here today by helicopter and then down the river by boat wasn't exactly easy. It's one of the last places you'd expect people to live and yet we know from discoveries made in this area in the last few years that there were people living here 20,000 years ago. The reason is that the conditions here then were different. Although it was colder and there were glaciers up on the mountains, it was also much drier. There would have been some trees along the river here, but in general the valleys were much more open and led up to broad grassy plains that were full of animals. The people who were living here then used these valleys as highways, living down on the coast in the winter and moving up through here in the spring to hunt. This area is also limestone and it's full of sinkholes and caves, although they're very hard to find, of course, because of the modern, very dense vegetation. Some of these caves have got archaeological deposits in them that go back 20,000 years. And one of these caves, Kutakaina Cave, which is really very spectacular and was only discovered in 1977, is just up there. Digging into the floor of the cave, archaeologists found large numbers of quartz tools. There were animal bones in profusion.
The cave was excavated in 1981, and of course it's all filled in now. But what was found here tells us quite a lot about the people who lived in this cave for about 7,000 years. They were clearly specialised hunters because most of the bones that were found here were wallaby. They also hunted wombats as well, and both of these animals are still common in Tasmania now. They made simple stone tools that were very similar to stone tools that were being used further north in mainland Australia at the time. And throughout the deposit there were lumps of red ochre, which they probably used for body decoration or cave art. And in fact there's a number of cave sites around here that have been found with art in them that probably date back to the Ice Age. It really is remarkable to think that there were people living in this cave this far south 20,000 years ago, at the height of the Ice Age. The human occupation of Kutakaina stops about 13,000 years ago. By this time, the seas had risen again, the climate was warming up, the glaciers were going, and the landscape we know now was being established. Around here, the rainforests were creeping up the valleys, so places like this were no longer the hunting areas they'd once been. Most important of all, the rising seas had separated Tasmania from mainland Australia. The islanders were cut off, so these Tasmanians were to remain out of contact with other people for the next 12,000 years. It was the longest isolation in human history. In their self-contained universe, the Tasmanians continued their southerly way of life. Their toolkit was efficient, but limited. They lacked the boomerang and the woomera, the spear thrower. When Europeans arrived, they thought the Tasmanians were very different from other Australians. But underneath, they're the same. Another example of the great variety among the first Australians. The new arrivals in Tasmania quickly closed off the options of the islanders, and their way of life has gone forever. Their isolation, 12,000 years of it, was unique. The Tasmanians have survived, but in the destruction of their traditional culture, humanity has lost something important, something that might have helped us understand what binds us all together. The rising seas cut off Tasmania, but they cut off Australia from New Guinea too. It was a time of change for people all over the continent, and new technologies and adaptations emerged. One area changed less than most though, and along the inland rivers of the Murray-Darling system, large numbers of people continued to refine a relatively easy existence. A winding green band marks the path of rivers across the brown plains, a corridor of river red gums. Their tangled roots and massive trunks anchor the banks like ancient buttresses. The bulk of Australia's population today lives in the southeast corner of the continent. It's a surprise to learn that it's probably been like that for many thousands of years. But the Aboriginal population centre was inland, not coastal, and focused on the two major rivers, the Murray and this river, the Darling. This was the heartland of Aboriginal Australia. The Murray-Darling Basin is flat and stable. Every year the rivers flood, gushing out across the plains to make billabongs and waterholes, full of fish and shellfish and tortoises. New grass on the floodplains brings the kangaroos out from cover, 
and makes them easier to hunt. Birds come in to breed in clouds. Ducks, swans, pelicans, ibises and egrets. Sometimes the river people could fill their canoes with eggs. At certain times, large numbers of people came together for ceremonies. At other times, Aborigines used to leave the river to live elsewhere for a while. They said they were bored with the food. Beyond the rivers, their water and their richness, past the dried up lakes, the sand dunes and the mulga, the country changes into desert, harsh and dangerous. But even here there were people. As we've seen, Australia's original discoverers and settlers came from Asia and Southeast Asia, from the humid tropics and through them, across a watery gap to reach this continent. Those hunter-gatherers adapted to the rainforests of the far north, the cold, wet forests of the extreme south, the well-watered parts of the coastal fringe and the major river valleys of the Murray and the Darling. But here in the heart of Australia, it was different. This arid central third of the country is one of the driest deserts in the world, and here they made their most critical and precise adaptation to this continent. To Europeans, the desert is so alien. Many white men have died here. They don't like it or try to understand it. You cannot bend the desert. It's people who have to bend. Aborigines have and know its moods and dangers. They know how the desert works, where to find water, where to look for it in a drought. They don't see a desert. They see a garden. Desert people merely surviving, eking out an existence? No. They too have lots of time for ceremony, for stories, for a complex social life. The desert does force people, though, to live in small groups, with isolation when times are harsh. Because of this, there's great variation in desert cultures, including art. Around Lake Eyre, flat, featureless, tough country, art carried a special message. Every place in the area had a name and a story to explain what that place represents. These stories were expressed as towers, small sculptures made of wood and clay and paint. Some towers include objects that signify special places, a plant, a shell, some lizard's feet. Others are likenesses, a crane or animal, a pelican's foot or human hand. Some tell a story about a place where the spirits of the dead climbed towards the stars or where a traveller was not tired, so he shook his leg to prove it. Towers are an art embracing geography and the natural world, as well as the mythology that explains it. Totemic designs, or trees across the desert, or waterholes and bends in the river. And yet their major purpose was not abstract or ornamental, but really very practical. People going on a journey made them as signposts. Each toa represented a particular place and they stuck one in the ground so that others would know where they'd gone. Desert society has survived much longer than most other Aboriginal lifestyles. The white man's fear 
has shielded its people from invasion and destruction, just as it has protected hunter-gatherers in other deserts of the world. Australia still has many hunter-gatherers, maintaining an ancient and successful way of living, using nature in a simple and direct way. For them, the land is everything. The past, the present, the future. These people walk across the land and yet are part of the land as well. For many people in this country and elsewhere, the Aborigines of the desert are a symbol of Australia and of the hunting-gathering tradition. Clearly, that tradition is only one of a whole spectrum of adaptations to a variety of environments that confronted people when they reached this continent. But that movement to Australia was itself one of several migrations out of Asia during the Ice Age. While some people were moving south towards the hot deserts in Australia, other people were slowly moving north into a very different kind of desert. 